There's a lot of buzzwords out there when it comes to artificial intelligence because it's a, well, hot topic in the media more than anything. But sometimes you need to demystify a whole bunch of stuff before you can get started. And that's exactly what we're doing today on the Data Radio Show. Hello there. In this week's episode of the Data Radio Show, I'm going to sit down and chat to AI expert Ola Bowser. He's going to demystify some of those terms and layers behind AI that maybe you don't necessarily know 100% of, especially if you're starting out in the industry. We're going to take a look at exactly how things like neural networks work and the different types of artificial intelligence that are out there. And we're going to take a look at how it works in building tools like Flow BI, which is a tool that's been designed by Scalefree out of Germany to help people build data architecture. But before we get into this week's interview, don't forget to hit that like button, share the video, subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening to this on a podcast, do all of those things as well, but in the podcast version of it, depending on the platform you're listening to. Anyway, let's jump over. Let's have a catch up with Ola and learn a little bit more about artificial intelligence. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of the Data Radio Show. Joining me this week, I've got Ola Bowser from Germany. I'm guessing it's like Germany, Germany. It's not like a part of Germany that's not really Germany, if that makes sense. Like one of the little outlying areas that are like not German, German, full on German. Yep. <laughs> okay. You can tell I come from the complete opposite end of the world. So I don't know my borders very well with these things. Although I did find out, weird little side note for you, because my ancestors are from Germany. We or we were told they were from Germany. Turns out they're from Poland. It gets things a little confusing sometimes. It's very strange. Anyway, hola. AI, you are a bit of an expert on this field. And I wanted to have a chat to you because one, I want to learn about Flow BI that I understand sort of getting up and running and I've had a look at some of the, the stuff that's come through on there. A little confused by the website, not sure why there's a school of fish on there, but it looks like a really interesting tool for helping to build data vault. And I know AI is getting a lot of talk at the moment around how it can be used for things like data warehousing, but I had a look over one of your presentations and there's a really interesting sort of basic breakdown of some of the sort of buzzwords and terms that we get a lot. I'm hoping you can sort of run me through it a little bit so that for people who might just be coming in who haven't really had a huge amount of experience in this field, they get a better understanding of what those terms actually mean and where maybe a little bit where they came from. Like I'm really curious about neural pathways and, and why they work the way that they work in AI and sort of the relation back to, to the human brain. Um, so I guess, yeah, the first, first big question is, what is AI? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, an easy this, one to start with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, AI, um, and I think everyone knows um, what these two letters mean. So it means artificial intelligence. Um, but yeah, what is behind is, a, is a, of course, a bit more difficult. And um, also, the understanding of what AI means has also shifted a bit from time to time. So while in, um, yeah, like 20 or 30 years ago, um, when people were talking about AI, they were meaning mm -hmm. the other thing for, of what is AI was more around, um, yeah, like some some general intelligent um, um, computer that is doing to is is able to do yeah any um, task that a human can do. Uh, nowadays, it's more like um, an understanding of that AI is a techniques. A technique or a set of techniques that enables computers to mimic specific human behavior. So there are a lot of different areas um, where this can fit, but of course, especially, especially, um, or it's all around the data. Yeah, and um, artificial intelligence itself, of course, also has um, yeah a lot of different subsets, as I said. So especially machine learning also um, deep learning and also another word that came yeah just came up the last years like generative ai and um yeah maybe to make it uh, short to give um, a short overview of all these yeah buzzwords in the end um so machine learning itself it uses just statistical mostly statistical methods um to enable computers to to learn from the data and improve um, but there's no, um, yeah, 
no no real intelligence behind it's just statistical methods and when it comes to deep learning um we get yeah these uh neural networks um these mystical neural networks um where everyone says it's like a black box you don't know what's happening inside but in the end you know what's happening inside but how these neural networks are deciding is a bit difficult to explain but yeah it's um it is able to learn very decent um stuff from the data and can mimic yeah human behavior way better and yeah then we have generative ai which um yeah is mostly part of deep learning and is used to generate new content it can be text it can be images it can be code and it can also be like what the data modeler um is doing like how yeah what flow bi is trying to do that was a really good in-depth explanation as well like, like that was really handy it, it feels to me kind of like these levels of artificial artificial intelligence the way that you've explained it you know machine learning sort of your high level stuff and something like generative ai is is down a few levels and it sort of incorporates other elements so it's it's one of those things that people kind of know the buzzwords for but don't know how it all fits into the big picture um yeah one of the things i've come across with generative ai and you might be able to answer this one for me you might not really bad at maths and i'm wondering if if there's a reason for that uh, so can you can you repeat the last so, so one of the things i've come across with generative ai seems to be really bad at, at mathematics problems um okay. mm -hmm. and I'm, it's one of those things i've seen people on twitter for example who are like well this can't be the future of everything because i can't do a, a basic maths problem can you explain why that is um yes there's there's an an, an actual reason for that so for for AI um, is especially very basic mathematical um, stuff like simple um, additions or subtractions are even not easy for an AI, and the reason is that an AI doesn't think in 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 um, yeah numbers like like we calculate. So in the end, all an AI knows is um, yeah stored in very big um, arrays and uh, matrices and um, there are no um, round numbers so you, you you never have um, round numbers in in these um, big matrices and therefore it's it's really hard for an AI to understand that these these um, clear separations between numbers that there's a one and a two and one and two is three that is very difficult um, for, for them to understand. I mean, um, yeah, bigger um, AI models um, are going, um, or yeah, researchers have found a good way to, to go around that and to make AI actually very good in mathematical stuff. And that is that the AI can define formulas and calculations, but it can't calculate it. So it just defines the calculations and then uses, yeah, like programs this calculation um in yeah program code and then this calculates it and th then yeah so nowadays ai has got way more better in calculating uh, mathematical expressions yeah but just versus yeah wound up nice um tell me a little bit about deep learning how do neural networks work i mean I'm, i imagine that the, the term itself comes from just how a brain works you know synapses firing connection points in the brain it, it must be a, a digital version of this um yeah you uh, so i mean the the name deep learning and especially neural networks um comes from the idea that it's a bit like a brain so in a, in a brain we have neurons and in a neural network we also have neurons um and it's also composed of of um interconnected um neurons they are but they are of course way more organized than in a real brain and they work of course very different um compared to a real brain but um yeah this this um comparison to a, to a brain is, is um yeah matches very good so we have these neurons and every neuron um has a yeah specific value and function for example also in, in um, yeah value and function and stores like a super super small information and one neuron alone doesn't know anything and is completely useless useless 
Um, but if they are organized um, in, in layers, you can have, um, yeah, all this complex logic we have today. So um, these layers often um, consist of, um, yeah, the first layer is often the, in, or is in general the input layer, where the, just the data gets into the neural network. And then you have mostly have a lot of hidden layers, so-called hidden layers, um, where you have, yeah, in, in nowadays um, models, billions of billions um, of trillions, even trillions of neurons, um, that are all interconnected. And then in the end, you have an output layer. Yeah, maybe you have like a model that um, detects if an image um, is showing a dog or a cat. Then in the output layer, you have maybe only two neurons that say, if one neuron activates, it says, okay, this is a cat. If the other neuron activates, okay, this is a dog. And yeah, but the role magic is of course in these hidden, big hidden layers um, where, yeah everything um, is um, stored and everything is trained. Yeah, so every neuron has a weight, a, speci a specific value, as I said at the beginning. Um, and in the training, all these values um, are, yeah, trained and optimized with, a specific, with a specific weights um, to learn all the complex patterns in the training data. So the cat versus dog one seems really simple in terms of how it operates for a human. We can look at that and go, that's a cat, that's a dog. For a, a digital neural network, is that then breaking it down going, this is the face shape, this is the whisker length that you'd find on a cat, but not a dog. And it, it, it narrows down its choices by basically eliminating or matching data? Um, I mean, you, yeah, so you can imagine it a bit in a way, but it's not detecting an an ear or a nose and says, oh yeah, that's a nose and it looks like a dog nose. It's more like um, it, it detects specific shapes and this can also be very, very hidden shapes that are not um, yeah, visible to, to our eyes or to, yeah, to the image because in the end, um, neural network only works on the um, um, yeah, data and not on the image. So every pixel, for example, has um, three different values for red, blue, and green. Uh, yeah, and um, it only uses these values. But actually, you can show that it detects specific shapes and a combination of specific shapes and contours. And if that's the case, it yeah can learn that um, something is a dog or a cat. But of course, it needs to know this image is a dog to learn it. A lot of dog images that are classified as dog images and cat images, and then it can learn it. Yeah, I read somewhere. I think it was in. It might have been a Chinese AI model where they were using it to originally try and find things like moles, cancerous moles on people's faces, and it ended up being so accurate that it could pick up cancer cells from a CT scan. Like it recognized the same kind of data inputs. Are there a lot of surprising? Uh, sort of opportunities for AI in that respect, things that humans might not necessarily have seen a connection to that have been discovered? Yeah, I mean, um, that's what's already um, happening um, today. We see a lot of different X-rays that, um, yeah, many um, X-ray images are already um, yeah, pre-sorted from AI models that, yeah, we're able to learn to somehow identify um, for example, cancer. Um, yeah, it, it works very similar to the uh, cats and dogs um, example, but only just about is there, for example, a possibility for cancer or not. And um, in the end, they are trained in a way that are very, very sensible. So um, they try to, to um, make the, um, yeah, weight of, of not detecting an X-ray image that actually has cancer very, 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 very low, almost zero. So um, it still has to be, um, yeah, and a doctor has to look, have to look at it um, afterwards, but yeah, it works very well to pre-sort all this stuff. Okay. Um, when you're building a neural network and you're putting these things together, how do you build the weight of the input? So it goes, you know, this much information is this important, that much information is that important. Is there a way of doing that while you're building this or is this something that machine learning basically does for itself now? Yes, in, in general, the AI learns it by itself. So um, 
it 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 works like i explained it already that we have a lot of um layers with a, with yeah billions of billions of neurons and they are all initialized with a random weight with a random number in the end and then that when the training starts um there's a process so called back propagation so and this is the the actual magic of of every neural network in the end um and it happens in a way that you put into the in the input data it runs through the neural network you get an output and then this output um is um yeah classified in the end so it is um the the ai can yeah classify by itself is this a good output or not mm -hmm. and um yeah after that it can optimize all the rates backwards to um improve this output so what so the only important um thing is that the i in the training process um has to know or the, the yeah the ai has to know what is correct and what not and um yeah then it learns it by itself um of course there are some other techniques in in ai like um yeah also reinforcement learning where also the ai learns it by itself and um there are also techniques where some user input is used to improve it. Um, that's also, for example, a way how uh, ChatGPT improved it to be to learn, um, yeah, a, a bit better the the contact with the, the the chat functionality in the end. Yeah, how to how to talk with people. This was trained um, also ethical consideration, like when it should not give an answer. This was trained, for example, based on user input, but the general AI model was completely trained on um, yeah on the data based on um, the spec propagation process. I imagine being, because you know, large language models obviously involve language. Um, how difficult then is it, as somebody who grew up in an English speaking country where English is primarily the language I know, how difficult is it to build something like this that works in something like German or French or know, American English? I mean, um, I would say the language doesn't really uh, matter because in the end you need just a lot of training data. And if it's in a specific language like English, then the AI model, of course, learns English. Mm -hmm. And if it's in German, it learns German. Um, but what you definitely need is, of course, a lot of um, specific knowledge into large language models and generative AI to be able to um, yeah, create and train your own large language model and a lot, a lot of resources. So a lot mm -hmm. of computer resources. Um, yeah, especially these big large language models are really, really resource intensive in the training. And um, yeah, one just one training um, process iteration costs like millions of dollars. So mm -hmm. um, at, at least for, for example, for ChatGPT, um, there are some estimations how much the training was actually, um, yeah, um, costing. But um, of course, it's possible to do it with less resources. But um, nowadays, people normally, if they want to train their own model for a specific purpose, they take some open source base models. So there are a lot of base models outside um, that are open source. And um, mm -hmm. for example, Meta has also published their big large language model called Llama. Um, they have published it open source. And then you can take it and you can just fine tune it, which means if you imagine all these layers with these hidden neurons, you just take the last ones where the output is decided and you just train this small part, which is needs way less resources. And then you can yeah, fine tune um, a general purpose model to train it for a specific task, like to be able to um, yeah, decide specific medical, medical decisions and act like a doctor, for example, or yeah, to do some other stuff. Does, uh, because it, it's learning at the same time as well, does it have issues around almost intangible concepts? Like, like it might be able to recognize, say, physical signs of love, you know, heart palpitations or pupils dilating, stuff like that. If you would describe, if, if it was to try and describe something like an emotion, would that mm -hmm. throw a spanner in the wrench because it doesn't have firsthand experience with being able to identify things like that? Yeah, and so I mean, love. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it, it's clear that this AI doesn't have any real feelings. Mm -hmm. But because it is trained on so much content, and of course also on it is also trained on books and also on on on, on love books, for example, mm -hmm. where maybe this emotion is is explained very detailed, it can also imitate it relatively good. So um, I've I've never tried it out, but um, I would uh, definitely expect that um, many large language models are able to um, yeah mimic um, like emotions um in 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 yeah in text of course only um relatively good yeah and i mean at um large language models are also very good in writing poems for example mm -hmm. and a good poem doesn't work without any emotions right so um yes but it still doesn't have a real understanding of emotions of course yeah in the end it's just just numbers in the background going back and forth and um Yep. Man, I feel like these were conversations they were having on Star Trek around the character data. Whenever he'd do something like write a book or, or play an instrument, it's like, yeah, you just, you're repeating what somebody else has done. Doesn't yes. feel like there's any originality to it. Hmm. That's all right. That's fine. Um, how then do we use something like artificial intelligence in its really broad sense to build data warehousing, data modeling? Yeah, I mean, um, in the end, we 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 can try to train any AI model to output whatever we want, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we already have AI models that can are really good in in writing text. We are already we already have AI models that are really good in generating images or even videos um, based on AI. And but there was not yet any AI that is able to generate. Um, yeah, models based on um, data. Yeah, we can use for our data warehouse. But uh, yeah, this is exactly where Flow BI um, comes in place. And uh, Flow BI has the, is the currently the only one that is um, yeah providing a tool where we where there we have a yeah a generative AI in the background that looks at the source data and tries to generate um, a valid data vault model or any other model. Um, yeah, for this data to use it on the database. For something like Flow BI, how nuanced is the detail? Because obviously everybody's data needs are different. Everyone's warehousing needs are going to be different. Um, is it looking at you know, everything down to a cell-on-cell a -cell level or is it looking sort of a broad picture going, you know, this is a bank, so this might be the best model for you. How detailed can we go? Yeah, so right now it's um, completely data driven. So mm -hmm. it also it not only looks it, it looks at um, mostly at two different things. So first one is metadata. So mm -hmm. like what are the names of the columns, what are the data types, um, and so on. And second, also on the actual data. For example, um, sometimes you can't really identify. For example, based on a column name, is there personal identifiable information in it or not. And this is important to know if you, for example, want to split your data into two satellites, one with privacy related data and one without. Um, yeah, so in general, it, it looks at, um, especially at the data, it's very data driven and looks at these two things. That, that does raise a really interesting question for me. If AI is doing that, does it then give you as a, a, a warehouse builder a chance to sort of step back and not be interacting directly with personal data? Because obviously that, that's a big deal everywhere in the world. There's, there's concerns from all sorts of corners about um, people's storage of personal data, what it gets used for and how it's accessed. Um, and, and being in Europe, you have the strictest rules in the world around it. Um, does having an AI tool that helps you build your warehouse give you basically an extra step of protection for yourself. Yes, I mean, um, regarding um, yeah, privacy um, related stuff, it's of course um, a bit difficult. Um, but I mean, in, in the end, we have to see how it will um, evolve through the AI Act from the European Union. But in mm -hmm. general, in the end, it's, it's just a tool that uses your data um, to build 
something new. And if you, in the end, you also have to store your data somewhere. And um, even in the in Europe, it's still allowed to, for example, store your data in the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. And this is also someone else's computer, right? So, um, yeah, I, I'm of of course not um, an expert in what all these laws um, belongs, but um, yeah, in general, there are many many tools companies are using that have access to privacy related data, right? Um, also, if yeah, many companies have like marketing um, departments, also they are using maybe some tools. Um, that is also using a lot of privacy-related data, right? Personal email addresses, names, maybe addresses, even addresses. So, yeah, of course, um, it's, um, yeah, a bit, um, yeah, difficult, but, yeah, um, in the end, other tools are also doing it. And it would be even possible to use Flow BI on, yeah, on-premise resources. Not sure if that is planned um, yet. Currently, there's only um, a cloud-based version, but mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And, and I'm guessing because of the way that AI works and the pattern recognition that's built into it, it's got to be a really handy tool for picking up things like um, areas that might need cleaning, inconsistent data patterns, for example, or outliers. Is that is that something that's sort of really deliberate with the build of something like Flow BI, knowing that this is a tool that could save a lot of time? You know, instead of manually going through data sets and finding these things. Yeah. So um, currently, Flow BI is not not able to to or, or yeah doesn't focus on on handling um, like inconsistencies in the data, um, correcting data, or even implementing business rules. So it only focuses on the raw world, and mm -hmm. only also on the model. So it also does not um, yeah actually build this model that it generates because. There's also a reason for it. We have already a lot of data warehouse automation tools um, like DBT or Data Vault Builder or other tools, and they are really good in what they do. So Flow BI focuses on building the model and mm -hmm. then auto can yeah automatically um, via some APIs export it, for example, to DBT or Data Vault Builder, which then builds the actual data warehouse based on this model. Okay. Um, is, are we running the risk of losing the art of data modeling if we're left, leaving it to AI? Um, I, I would say no, because um, it, yeah, um, you, at first it only generates the raw world, so you still have to work in the business world. Mm -hmm. um, that's the first point. So, um, and I would say, in, in, in based on my experience, I would say, um, building and implementing business rules in the business world and using, yeah, building up the business world is um, normally more work than in the raw world. Of course, this is the general foundation and it's very important, but um, it's very pattern based. Yeah, so everything is defined in the raw world and relatively clear. And, um, but I would say, even if you use a tool like Flow BI, you still have to know how data world works and you need an understanding of data world but um, especially when it comes to very big source systems with thousands thousands or ten thousands of um yeah tables it's just a lot of repetitive work to build a big model and um, based on so many tables and this is the point where flow bi can yeah help very good any predictions for the future or something like this? Like, are we going to be at a point where we can say, here is your organization, this is what the model is that we want to use, go to it, AI, and make them do everything? Um, yeah, so, I mean, um, Flow BI is consistently improved and, and um, developed, and, um, yeah, more and more features um, are coming in. I'm, I'm not sure if I can say any specific feature that will come in, in, in the future, but um, I would say the focus at the beginning is a bit more on um, supporting more source, um, yeah, source systems, yeah, and also more general sources, like not a specific source system, but more like a general data lake. So mm -hmm. this AI can then go into the data lake and there can be any data from any source system you can imagine, and it is able to model based on this data. Yeah. Okay. 
one last question for you. Do you think that there's a bit of fear mongering over out there about AI in general because it's new and new stuff always scares people. Um, do we need to be scared? And what sort of advice would you give to people who are a little bit wary of it? So um, I personally, I'm not scared at all about AI. I also hear it about uh, from from um, a lot of other people, but as long as you know how AI, at least on a just a basic level, if if you know how it works, um, it's yeah you can use it and improve a lot on um, by using AI. And I don't think AI will yeah replace um, many jobs. I mean um, there are just new jobs and new opportunities coming, and maybe some jobs are getting way more efficient. But um, yeah, I don't think there are like mass firings <laughs> because everyone replaces their employees with AI. I don't think that's, that will happen. I mean, yeah, I don't know how many years ago, but when in the, for example, in the car industry, when they started in the car manufacturing using robots, also everyone was saying, okay, everyone um, in the car industry will lose their jobs and also their, their yeah, of course, jobs change and this will always happen with or without AI and yeah, but I think it's important to, um, yeah, yeah, be up to date and um, also to, to be open in, yeah, using AI because um, in my opinion, it, it can, yeah, help a lot. It can improve your, your um, processes a lot and um, yeah. Fantastic. I think that's all my questions. I've learned heaps today. So thank you very much for that. Um, is there somewhere that people can hunt you down if they want to connect? Uh, sorry, the last word was? Is there somewhere people can hunt you down if they want to connect? Somewhere like LinkedIn? Do you have like yeah, a, sure. a LinkedIn page? Yeah, so, yeah. Or um, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Around? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, where it's just my name, Ole Bowser. Um, yeah. You can connect and um, yeah. Also, if you want to talk about AI and and specific tools and yeah. Fantastic! Thank you very much, Ola. Being very Thank educational. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for checking out this week's episode of the Data Radio Show. And I want to thank Ola again for sitting down and going through the basics with me. I think it's a really fantastic tool for people who might just be starting out in the industry or looking at it as a possible career option just to get a bit of a groundwork as to what some of these terms mean and how they can impact the work that you might be doing a little bit further down the line. As I said at the start, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, tell everybody about what's going on. And until next time, live long and prosper. May the force be with you. And I'll catch you guys all next week.